we've got a, a, a panel that we've we've assembled of some of our experts all over the country to talk with us uh, this this morning, this afternoon, about what I what I wish we had done in the last uh, financial crisis. For those of you who were around back in 2008 and 2009, there was a lot of stimulus money that uh, suddenly became loosened. And a lot of opportunities came along, particularly for people that were ready for that money when it came along. And if you read the newspapers now, you know, and we'll be talking about this, President Biden's administration is, is really increasing the amount of money that's gonna be spent in the, in the area of brownfields. Uh, his proposed budget is on the order of four or five times the kind of money that EPA has had in the past uh, to help with brownfield investments. And uh, it, it, as we learned last time, it's really important to get ready for those opportunities before they, uh, before they, before they arrive. From the West Coast, uh, we have my colleague, uh, Dan Johnson, a vice president with SCS Engineers, and really one of the, the leading uh, authorities on brownfield redevelopment in the country. Uh, Dan's uh, activities in the Redevelopment and Reuse Council of the uh, Urban Land Institute are known to many. And Dan has been at the forefront of some of the, the more interesting projects that have happened in Southern California over the last 20 years. And we're delighted to have him with us. Good morning. In the heartland of Oklahoma, we have our colleague, Amy Jaslowski. Amy is our national expert in obtaining brownfield grant funding from EPA. She's written a number of successful uh, brownfield grant applications for locations, jurisdictions all over the country. And uh, she's gonna be sharing with us her perspectives, both in kind of that national perspective on funding uh, and some local projects there in Oklahoma City that are pretty intriguing. So welcome to Amy. And then from uh, the South Florida hotbed of real estate development, we have our senior vice president, Eddie Smith, Eddie has, uh, for the last uh, 20 odd years, been working on um, essentially helping real estate developers repurpose land that was once used for something, now needs to be used for something else. And Eddie's gonna share with us some of the secrets uh, that he's uh, discerned from his years of practice in the area. And I realize that you probably already know what brownfields are. Uh, that's one reason why you might be here to listen to our presentation or our conversation today. But I thought it would be useful to start with uh, asking Amy if she could just help us a little bit understand what are brownfields so we can get on the same page or make sure we're on the same page. Sure. So as we're driving around our communities, uh, brownfields are those old abandoned gas stations, dry cleaner, old dry cleaner facilities, um, commercial properties, old light industrial properties, sometimes even just old structures. Um, I have a colleague in, in Arkansas who calls them the Scooby-Doo properties in our community. So kind of a little mysterious. We may not know uh, what challenges are there, but from a, a definition perspective, it's important to kind of couch our conversation today, understanding that brownfields are real property that um, are challenged, the ex expansion, redevelopment, or reuse are, are challenged or complicated by the presence or the potential for the presence of hazardous substances or uh, pollutants or contamination. But these is really uh, economic engines in our communities. So just talk a little bit about that. I do. So there's, you know, there's that context of potential for contamination and, and pollution and the removal of blight, but, but honestly, as the, you know, the Brownfields advocates and people that are working in this field, maybe many of you on this call, brownfields and, and redevelopment are just excellent opportunities to drive economic developments, um, both public and private in our communities. And we oftentimes are seeing that happen in our, you know, more urban spaces. So we're able to prevent urban sprawl, we're able to um, prevent uh, green space development, kind of tighten in on our infrastructure reuse and things like that. Yeah, I wonder if you could uh, help us with just a little bit, uh, the opportunities that we see coming at us. I alluded to those some in my opening remarks, uh, but uh, where do you see uh, EPA's interest uh, in, brown, in, in, in promoting brownfield redevelopment? 
Sure. So, you know, historically, as Brownfields practitioners, it's been this idea of, you know, beating back blight and promoting economic development. And Brownfields has been really successful at those things. But as we look at some of these larger issues and challenges that the current administration and EPA are trying to solve, and we um, ourselves are trying to solve, and our communities are working with clients to solve, you know, there are these larger issues that touch in Brownfields. So we're, we, I really think that funding will um, connect to Brownfields because we're going to be looking at Brownfields redevelopment as an opportunity to improve sustainability and improve um, health outcomes and resiliency and also to um, improve preparedness and discussions and outcomes for our, our environmental justice and sensitive populations in our community. So there's there's a lot there that kind of our um, focus of our current administration that I think will will elevate Brownfields as a topic um, moving forward. Again, I alluded to it. Uh, what's your understanding of what we're looking at in terms of Brownfield grant funding uh, later this year? Oh gosh, a, a lot, a, a fire hose of, of funding I think we'll see. We saw um, the previous administration, the Trump administration back in December approved, um, I think more than $90 million um, into the Brownfields grant program. And then we expect, I think we saw another, was it $50 million that the Biden administration approved the American Rescue Plan Act uh, recently. So as you mentioned in your introduction, Mike, we were seeing four to five times the magnitude of, of funding in these grant programs through EPA. And those funding dollars are available to um, our municipalities, local units of government, nonprofits, tribes, and they're available to help assess brownfield sites, identify brownfield sites in our communities, um, clean up those sites, plan for redevelopment in those sites. There's lots of opportunities along the arc of a redevelopment project for those funds to be engaged. I think one of the things that that certainly is going to matter um, even more going forward than it has in the past is the whole concept of uh, environmental justice. Uh, one reason why Administrator Administrator Regan was selected to be head of EPA was his strong background in environmental justice. Some of these grant uh, programs that you just described, Amy, are going to be earmarked uh, in significant portion for environmental justice communities. Help us understand a little bit about what environmental justice is and how that affects um, uh, our conversations. Sure, I think, you know, environmental justice has been at the core of the EPA um, administration's uh, process for a very long time. It's something that we, we deal with in Brownfields all the time. And what we're, what we're, I, Think we're seeing with this administration is that they're really doubling down in these communities and, and putting some money um, in these places and spaces towards these communities. So when we're looking at environmental justice, what we're really talking about is these sensitive communities, um, low income, minority communities that have often been um, uh, impacted to a higher degree or not brought to the table to talk about some of these challenges in their communities. So when we're, when we're talking about environmental justice and we're thinking about the funding that may come to help us support these communities, one of the things that EPA has is an environmental justice screening tool. And that, what that really does is lets us identify those communities, which is really the first step. So understanding the demographics, where are the low income and minority uh, portions of our community and how are they disproportionately affected by environmental conditions in our community. And the EJ screen helps us um, kind of overlay those two things. Um, I think, yeah, the next slide has a kind of a quick peek at that. It, it creates an indices to say, uh, to help us understand if there's actually a disproportionate or high percentile 
of our sensitive populations that are being impacted by things like traffic pr proximity or proximity to Superfund sites or lead-based paint proximity, which would indicate an older housing stock and maybe a, a lack of investment in a certain community. But, but understanding where these areas are and aligning them with our community's goals or perhaps from a private development perspective, aligning them with our development goals there um, will I think allow us to access more of these dollars that uh, EPA and the federal government are putting out. And this is, a, I think, an opportunity for some early involvement for, for planning ahead. Uh, as I understand, environmental justice fundamentally boils down to having meaningful involvement of, uh, of the community, including especially underrepresented members of the community, and then meaningful involvement, uh, uh, well, and then fair treatment after we consider what their feedback is, you know, build it into the, uh, uh, the project going forward in a, in a meaningful way, um, in a way that's fair. And, uh, um, and, and in part that could involve uh, you know, any number of uh, uh, negotiations with uh, representatives of the community and likewise, or and, and things like that. And we're, and we're actually seeing, you know, guidance coming out for that, you know, how to, um, to help us engage um, in a more systemized, systematic way. I know out in California, there's specific guidance. Um, Dan, maybe you can speak a little more to that, but they're developing a protocols and a program for how, and, and I think funding attached to it perhaps for how we work with the EJ communities. Right, yeah, no, it's an interesting opportunity. In fact, um, over the last two days, uh, there have been uh, listening sessions in California hosted by DTSC. And uh, this has to do with uh, a placeholder in the uh, budget for next, next fiscal year uh, for $300 million, which is uh, it's a pretty significant chunk of money. Uh, and the, uh, the funding is uh, intended to go for uh, investigative as well as remediation work uh, targeted to brownfields. Uh, but then the, the overlay uh, for that is exactly as you were just discussing uh, an emphasis on environmental justice communities uh, using the, uh, the California analog to what you're talking about, the EPA screening tool, uh, uh, Cal Enviro score. So basically uh, screening communities uh, across some of those factors that you're talking about. Uh, and then also looking, um, looking at from the point of view of what is it that we wanna do with this money? So think, thinking of it in terms of, you know, the brownfield sites and the investigations and the cleanups, but um, you know, we always wanna be thinking about the end use. And so in this case with the nexus and emphasis on housing and affordable housing. So California has a, a dire housing shortage, probably something on the order of 3.5 million housing units uh, short of what we need. So how do we create that housing? So looking at a nexus between uh, brownfields and, um, and affordable housing, this $300 million, uh, uh, $220 million of which uh, I think is uh, direct funded through DTSC or at least as proposed for investigations and remediations, uh, uh, also a, a subcategory of emphasis for dry cleaner sites, and then approximately $70 million in, in grants to communities and nonprofits for investigations and cleanups. So it's a, it's a pretty big chunk of money and then with this uh, environmental justice uh, uh, overlay as, as we've been discussing. Dan, if I may, uh, while, while you've got the talking stick, uh, I think one of the, maybe to take a half a step back here, the, uh, the hesitancy uh, in investing in brownfields, at least on the part of some conservative uh, developers, has been uh, the whole, whole subject of liability and how to manage liability. And I know you've had some experience here in the last several years. The trends are, there are some pretty practical tools that people have available uh, to manage those liabilities. Um, and I wonder if you could talk with us a little bit about what some of those look like. Yeah, of course, you bet. And Mike, did you want me to uh, provide some context too in terms of uh, Superfund and sort of the, the basic lane of the groundwork or? Sure, I mean, you might, yeah, why don't you talk to us a little bit about where, where the liability comes from and then, uh, exactly. what the tools are to manage it. So, uh, of course, uh, everyone will remember Love Canal, right? So, uh, as sort of a, uh, uh, a watershed moment for as things were changing in the United States in the early 1980s, uh, as, a, as a catalyst uh, for the uh, first version of CERCLA or the Superfund law, 
uh, revised in, two, in 2005 uh, uh, small business, uh, uh, I'm gonna blank on the, uh, the name, Mike, maybe you remember the 2005 had a very specific name. Um, in any case, the uh, Superfund revised in 2005, uh, looking at the liability framework uh, joint and several strict and retroactive liability. Uh, it, it's basically made everybody who was doing real estate transactions in the 80s and 90s and on nervous about if I, if I get involved with something that has contamination, could I possibly be liable for the entire cleanup, even if I didn't cause any of the contamination, looking at the concepts of strict liability or joint and several uh, retroactive as well. The phase one industry uh, was born out of that. And so there are defenses to Superfund liability. There's state analogs in a, lot, in a lot of the states in terms of the Superfund liability. Certainly there are, is in California. So what do we do to manage our liability? Uh, we do phase one environmental site assessments. Uh, ASTM stepped in, uh, created a, a standard uh, for, for phase one environmental site assessments. If we comply with ASTM standards, uh, even if a property has some contamination using the innocent landowner defense or the bona fide prospective purchaser defense, uh, then that's a very important tool in our ability to buttress and push back against uh, Superfund liability. Um, <clears throat> look, looking, looking at um, phase ones is just one aspect of the risk management process, right? There's other ways that we can and should manage risk. Uh, certainly if we know a property has contamination, uh, most uh, if not all states uh, have some sort of a voluntary cleanup program. Uh, that's an important element, right? So we can look at those uh, to, to try and understand and manage our, manage our risks. So real estate's local, and I would say in this case, so are the regulations. It's important to understand what the local regulatory uh, context is. Uh, and there are many um, uh, self-implementing rules, right? So there's uh, cleanup guidance that is developed to help people uh, guide cleanups um, if perhaps a regulatory oversight isn't necessary or, or desired. Uh, we have a lot of tools at our disposal that we can that we can deploy. Um, looking at maybe a slightly broader context, uh, so I was talking about phase one as an important element of risk management. Uh, what are the other um, liability management risk transfer tools that we have at our disposal? How do we de-risk a project? So if we have a brownfield site and we have, uh, we've done our phase one, we've done our phase two, we have some understanding of what the environmental issues are and perhaps uh, taking it as far as, uh, you know, what are, what are the likely remedial alternatives, even costed out what the, uh, the, the remedial design is, is likely to translate into. Uh, we can look at things like uh, uh, developing a, a fixed price remediation program for someone. Uh, that's something that um, SES has experience with. Uh, there's various um, uh, sort of shades or varieties of, of uh, risk transfer programs for remediation all the way up to and including uh, guaranteed fixed price remediation. Uh, that, can, that can either be something that's taken uh, as I would call it a balance sheet risk or uh, more often uh, looked at in conjunction with uh, cost cap or stop loss insurance. Uh, there, are, there are definitely some insurers who are in the market for cost cap. Uh, there's some interesting um, variations on the old cost cap model where we are seeing, uh, I guess I would call it co-insurance um, that's uh, de-risking the, uh, the, the product for the insurance company. So it's more cost effective, I think, than it used to be. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, we're always looking for funding for our clients in terms of, you know, how do we provide funding so we can transfer the risk, but how do you fund the project? So uh, looking at things like in California, if there's the uh, leaking underground storage tank cleanup fund uh, that has a sub account that funds brownfields site cleanups is called the SCAP. Uh, we have had considerable success getting our clients into that program. That's about $40 million a year. Uh, and that will fund effectively a whole variety and different types of cleanups. There's something called the orphan site cleanup fund that will, found, that will provide funding for uh, leaking underground storage tank brownfield site cleanups. And then of course the DTSC money that I, that I just mentioned. Um, so there's a, there's a variety of sources. Uh, actually, as I speak at this very moment, uh, the legislature in California is considering a piece of legislation that would shift some of the approximately $300 million a year that's collected by the state cleanup fund <clears throat> into Brownfields uh, sites into this gap program that I mentioned that would take that funding of that program uh, 
uh, theoretically up from uh, around 40, 40 million to around 100 million. They're, uh, the legislation uh, is, is studying how to do that. So there's a lot of funding sources that are available out there. And then Mike, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the remediation trust and, and uh, QSFs. Oh, sure. Let me at least mention, uh, mention those a little bit. The, um, one, one of the, the problems historically uh, with uh, financing uh, cleanup projects is sometimes a large company that was responsible for uh, the contamination um, has trouble with uh, the tax treatment of the money they spend. I and mean, if they set up a, an escrow fund or something like that to handle remediation, it's not all deductible uh, initially. At least that was a problem early on in the Superfund uh, process. And, um, and so IRS has helpfully published some, some guidance, some rules, and uh, there are now uh, environmental remediation trusts that are fully deductible as they're funded and qualified settlement funds if, um, if these liabilities are, are settled in the right way. And uh, the IRS rules uh, have been helpful in, in getting um, uh, additional money uh, devoted to uh, cleanups uh, in support of brownfields projects. Uh, Dan mentioned the uh, the Superfund amendments in 2002 that, that introduced the bona fide prospective purchaser uh, defense to Superfund. Um, and a bona fide prospective purchaser defense requires that you do that phase one Dan talked about. It requires that you, to the extent you know about problems, that you do reasonable steps to deal with those problems and comply with any continuing uh, institutional controls or similar obligations. And then here uh, in 2018 in the Build Act, Congress uh, extended uh, the bona fide prospective purchaser defense uh, to tenants that comply with these uh, steps. So that had been a kind of a gap in the in the defense, and the Build Act filled that uh, um, that hole a little bit. Probably also worth just mentioning that you know these Superfund uh, liabilities, a strict liability that we've talked about, also creates an avenue for funding uh, to the extent that the uh, responsible party is available and has um, resources. Um, I can clean up a piece of property and um, I can ask, uh, I, can, I can, can command a responsible party to reimburse me for those costs. I have to comply with certain rules. My cleanup has got to be a so-called circular quality, a super fun quality cleanup. And I have to be, uh, conduct myself consistently with the national contingency plan which is a set of rules that uh, EPA has published for how we want the roadmap essentially for how you respond uh, to um, releases of uh, uh, hazardous substances, pollutants, and contaminants. The um, and an important step uh, of the national contingency plan is to have public participation to solicit the kind of feedback that Annie was talking about uh, from the community in which the uh, uh, the site is located so that we can take those uh, suggestions, uh, comments into account. And then I, on a related note, if the uh, party that caused the pollution is not viable, well, they may have an insurance uh, policy or several insurance policies, which uh, could provide uh, some assets, some, uh, some cash uh, with which to clean up the site for the, in, in, in those circumstances where, uh, and, and obviously some combination of those two also could be considered. Um, the responsible parties know who their insurers are. I think, uh, Mike, uh, uh, just a quick variation on that, th that theme, uh, uh, looking at uh, first party uh, recovery uh, for, from insurance policies. So effectively, uh, we, we have, a, have a polluter who's a client who has uh, caused contamination, uh, then going back and uh, doing insurance archaeology and, and looking at their pre-1985 insurance policies, uh, uh, checking to see if their old general liability policies may may have coverage uh, that predates the uh, the pollution exclusion. For example, we've had considerable success uh, partnering with law firms who specialize in that and working on cost recovery. Uh, uh, so in this case, first first party cost recovery to help fund cleanups, whether it's you know large industrial companies, entities, uh, you know a whole whole variety of of different types of companies. And as I say, there's, there's there, there are many, uh, many proven tools that we're getting more, more and more experience with as we uh, proceed down this interesting area of our practice. I want to turn now to Eddie Smith. And uh, Eddie, uh, you do a lot of work for uh, real estate developers in South Florida. 
Uh, time is money. How, how do you how do you approach a contaminated real estate problem on behalf of a developer client? Yeah, Mike, you're exactly right. You know, here we're not seeing funding being the issue. It's time to market is is the issue. Uh, it, prices on you know from industrial to residential are extremely high right now. So our our clients are under a lot of pressure to get their product out in the market. And I mean some of the types of projects we're seeing large agricultural tracks that are being converted to uh, communities, residential communities. We're seeing industrial facilities being built on these tracks. Uh, a lot of golf courses have gone out of business in the last several years. So we're seeing a lot of residential communities, single multifamily, and even landfills. Um, we primarily uh, converting landfills to industrial sites, but we, we actually are working on one project. We're, we're very fortunate. It's a mixed use uh, development on a landfill that has views of Biscayne Bay and these incredible water features on the site. So really neat stuff that's happening. But, but so yeah, um, a little bit different approaches. You know, some of the things that, you know, that we routinely uh, talk to our clients about in, internally, um, we focus on is understanding what the client's goals are, because we have to keep our eye on the ultimate development in order to put together a good strategy. Uh, because a lot of that will factor in to how we develop our scopes of work for testing and if there's remediation required. Um, so, um, you know, for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if we're preserving, not that we do this very often, but across the country, preserving a historic building, uh, we really want to understand what the program is for that building. Um, so we can focus on the areas that might have already deteriorated or the areas that are going to be demolished versus the part that's going to remain untouched. So we focus our sampling in, in those areas. Um, the other thing, for instance, you know, we, we may come to a site that is at a low lying elevation and it's going to require several feet of fill just to get to, to the flood uh, elevation. So um, right away then we're talking with our client about the potential for them taking the restriction, using that fill that they really need for structural and flood control uh, to, to function as a cap for any contamination that's below it. Uh, so those are the things that, that we keep in mind as we develop our programs. Um, so generally, when, when we approach a site, uh, we want to understand what, what the program is for the site, whether it's going to be a, a industrial, commercial development, um, residential, and if it's residential, if it's going to be single family or multifamily. And then typically the next thing we'll ask the client is, are you willing to take a restriction on the property? Um, and they may not, most people say, no, we'd rather not. Uh, but then when we go through um, and, and walk through the numbers, it might drive the decision. So. Um, it used to be that we would clean these sites up and then turn them over for development. But, but nowadays, with the ability to take that restriction, we can close them, leaving the contamination in place, what we call risk-based corrective action. Um, so essentially what we'll do is, is oftentimes we'll, we'll cap or encapsulate that soil contamination so that the users of the site just can't get to it. So. When we, when we do approach a client, um, there's a few things that we key in on and a few questions that we ask the client so that we can develop the strategy that works for them. And I'll, I'll run through a, a list of a few of those really important questions. Um, so we'll, set, we'll ask, are you selling the property or parcels or is it a long-term hold? Uh, because that may dictate the type of closure that we're gonna pursue. Um, are you open to taking a restriction on some portions or all of the site, as I mentioned earlier? And if we're taking the restrictions, do we have to have the, the covenant recorded prior to sale, sale of the property or portions of the property? Um, if there is an HOA or a POA involved, then they can actually assume a lot of the liability on the, the maintenance and things like that when it comes to the closure. Um, 
And, and frankly, geotechnical recommendations, um, often we can combine what the geotechnical engineer will, will require with our soil remedy. So it's important to understand those things. Um, I alluded to earlier, whether the site is an import or export soil site uh, is very important. We, of course, we want to mi minimize export of contaminated material because that often has to go to a landfill it can be rather pricey. Um, and then if it is an export, we, we try to you know, use that as, as part of an engineering control. And then in, certainly in South Florida, we get into issues about stormwater management and how stormwater systems can either help or they can exacerbate uh, contamination, contamination issues that we might have on site. So it's important to deal with those early on in the project and, and not be held up uh, when we get down the road on you know, the civil design. Start with the end in mind. Um, we, I amplify one point quickly, Mike? Sure. Hey, uh, Eddie, one of the things that we find, uh, and you, you probably do too, is trying to understand, you, you alluded to it, uh, trying to understand the soil balance at a site, right? So if, if we have contamination that we have to address and deal with, what's the soil balance? Uh, is the site overall balanced? Is it net export? So those are much different contexts in the translation of cost to, to uh, somebody's uh, performa can be very dramatic if you've got a lot of net export and you're trying to figure out ways to deal with contamination. Sometimes you can manage it on site, right? Um, I think the other, the other issue that we sometimes see, uh, uh, I've, we've encountered this as we've come in uh, sort of in a pinch hitting situation trying to address a project that's pretty far along is a consultant has looked at the project from the point of view of, of risk and maybe there's contamination on site and the contaminants aren't at uh, high enough concentrations to translate into a health risk. But if the site's a net export site, then there's still that translation onto their, onto their performa for extra cost to deal with that. And I've seen some pretty big late hits to some, to some of our clients' projects um, where that wasn't taken into consideration. So. Just a couple of quick thoughts. Yeah, golf courses is one where we really get into a cut and fill analysis uh, because, you know, that's the only place where we have any undulating terrain here in South Florida is a golf course. Um, so, yeah, we do. We have to take into account once it's leveled, um, the, the import export. There's also typically lakes to fill on those golf courses and sometimes lakes to create. So we have to understand the quality of material we're going to need for the fill and what we're going to get from the excavation. Uh, one, one just the interesting thing about golf courses and when, one of the things that we do often on these sites is blend the soil. We're, we're allowed to do that here in Florida is we can bring in clean fill and blend it to reduce the overall concentration, uh, usually arsenic that we're dealing with at, at those sites. Um, but what we found, we, we did, we were starting assessment on one area of a, of a golf course. And when you do your testing before the site is leveled, it's gonna look a heck of a lot different than the soil quality once it's leveled. So the approach we do now is we just do very little sampling um, to get comfortable that we're gonna be able to remedy the site. And then really we'll, we won't get after it in detail until after frankly, after the, the, our client has purchased the property and has leveled it, then we'll go out there and we'll figure out exactly the ratios for blending and things like that. Um, I've asked each of our panelists to uh, walk us through a case study, look at some uh, uh, dirty pictures and some really neat pictures. Um, and Eddie, you've got the floor most recently. Why don't we go ahead and ask you to start with the, uh, uh, the South Florida site that I'll put on the screen. Okay. Yeah, this is a, it's a former uh, C&D construction demolition debris landfill. The entire property is 500 acres. So it's almost a square mile section. Um, and it's interesting because from a, an environmental closure perspective uh, and permitting, I think it's easier, frankly, to um, build on a, on a landfill than it is on some of our contaminated properties. And the reason, and I don't mean, not from a geotechnical perspective. So let me just say that. From an environmental closure and permitting. The reason is we know what we're getting into. 
right? We're, so we don't have to do a bunch of testing because there is technically no soil there to test. We know that we're gonna have to cap the site. Um, the landfill has made that decision for us already because you know, we're, we're not gonna remediate the solid waste. Although on, we do have one site where we, we did remove all of the solid waste, but it was a lot less than 500. Um, so, so we know we're gonna go in with, with, with a cap. Um, this is a project that uh, is being, the site is being converted into a, a state-of-the-art logistics center. So it's lar very large warehouses from 250,000 square feet up to 750,000. And most of the area then is impervious. Um, so the building, the truck courts, parking lots um, can all serve as engineering control. Um, there, is, there is one unique thing about that site though, is that it does have a 30 acre park. So it's not impervious. Um, but, but one of the things we did there is rather than put the standard two feet of clean fill cover, uh, we designed an alternative. Um, so we used a high visible geotextile fabric with one foot of cover, and we were able to save about half a million dollars on that. Um, the previous slide is just the, it's a little schematic of, uh, of something unique about the site. It required, the site required groundwater remediation system. So what we did is we integrated the groundwater remediation system with the stormwater system. And we were able to preserve over 100 acres of developable land that otherwise would have had to be excavated for stormwater ponds. So in that, just, just that generated uh, several hundred million dollars of revenue for our client because they were able to preserve that developable um, so really what I have to say about all of these sites is, you know, keep the goal in mind. It's a development project. It's not an environmental project and be creative because there's really not one way to approach any of these. All right. Thank you, Eddie. Um, you know, you mentioned, I think, uh, the, the the project with the view of Key Biscayne or Biscayne Bay. Yes. Have I got lucky? Do I got the right uh, rendering up here on the? Uh... That's the one. Yeah. These uh, two of these towers are already built, and this uh, Crystal Lagoon is built and being used right now. It's a it's a seven to eight acre um, lagoon, as we call it. But, yeah. It's it, it basically it's a huge swimming pool. You know, think Disney World. Um, and it's used for not just for swimming, it has beach access and, you know, used for paddleboard and things like that. So it's a, it's a great project. Uh, Dan, um, I know that you've been very involved in finding ways to put uh, alternative energy on Brownfield sites. Uh, how does that look? How does that work? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, opportunity, Mike, and uh, SES has been, uh, Working in this area for, for quite some time, so whether it's a uh, whether it's a brownfield site or a or a landfill, uh, uh, not all landfills or brownfield sites um, uh, necessarily translate very well into a beneficial reuse. Uh, you know, with uh, buildings or structures uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, you know, if you think about the the principal criteria that we're looking for for a Say a solar PV project, you know, a, a large amount of open space. It's accessible. In the case of a landfill, you know, we're, we can't compromise the integrity of the of the cover system. So, those are all issues that we've had to address. And um, with the price of uh, solar panels coming down, there's uh, uh, in a lot of markets there's pretty close to uh, a parity in terms of the wholesale rate per kilowatt hour for what solar PV can provide. Uh, there's still both uh, RECs and some uh, investment tax credits that are available to at least for a little bit longer. We'll see what happens with the Biden administration. They might get extended. So you put all those things together and you, uh, you create some interesting opportunities for solar PV projects. Uh, so it's definitely something that we're interested in and uh, ha have active conversations going with uh, developers in this area, really all across the, all across the country. So. And then I know you mentioned earlier, uh, affordable housing as being a critical need in, in California. I think your case study uh, speaks to that a little further. 
Yeah, most most definitely. Uh, this is a great story. Um, it's a it's a project uh, near downtown San Diego. Uh, our client is uh, Bridge Housing, uh, one of the preeminent uh, tax credit based uh, uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers in in California, really the West Coast. Uh, this uh, neighborhood and community is it's very close to uh, Petco Park. It's about uh, one mile east, uh, Logan Heights, uh, Barrio Logan, effectively. What you see here is uh, uh, the remnants of an old uh, bus yard. It, it belonged to San Diego City Schools. They RFP'd the site in the early 2000s. Uh, our client was part of a collaborative uh, that was successful at the RFP. A tremendous number of challenges associated with this site. Uh, Brownfields is just one of the checkboxes that they had to address. It's a Scatter site, as you can see, with uh, public improvements and, and right of way right through the site. So lots of utility relocation and cost. Uh, as a result of the former bus yard use, uh, there is a fair amount of impacted soil that had to be uh, addressed, leaking underground storage tanks, uh, impacted fills, a pretty common occurrence close to and in, in proximity to downtown San Diego, uh, burn ash, uh, metals impacted fill. Uh, because of the nature of the, uh, go ahead and uh, I'll fast forward if you wouldn't mind. Because of the nature of the project, uh, uh, there's subterranean parking uh, that had to be created because of the density of the project, as you can see here. So we have multi-story uh, mixed use. Uh, so this is this export dynamic that I was talking about a minute ago. So the net export of this project was about 50,000 cubic yards uh, and about 25,000 of that uh, was impacted. Uh, we helped our client uh, Bridge Housing obtain some uh, early money to do uh, investigative diagnostic work. So some soft cost at risk was uh, funded through a state program. And then in addition, uh, there's about $2 million that we helped them obtain uh, from the state of California, a program that used to exist through the California Pollution Financing Authority, uh, around $2 million that was quite helpful to the project performa. The result is dramatic. I mean, th this this is a catalytic project for this neighborhood. Uh, you know, this is the pet co park for this neighborhood. Uh, it really has been transformational for them. Uh, 200 affordable housing units were created. 130 of those are uh, a multifamily, 70, 70 units for seniors, 13,000 feet of commercial space. There's a child care center there. There's a medical clinic. So again, uh, just it's a really remarkable project. It's a beautiful project, which you can see here. Uh, they did a really nice job, I think, of uh, uh, creating a beautiful project for the neighborhood. And it's uh, the result of the collaboration. There's probably uh, a dozen different uh, collaborators and players that, that uh, made this happen and, and uh, a su successful project that's won to date seven different awards. Well, congratulations again on that, Dan. Very interesting. Mark asked a question, if it's possible to have an online landfill uh, and uh, county-owned landfill, can we have that declared formally some kind of a brownfield site, excavate the waste, perhaps relocate the waste into a, a new lined landfill, um, and then redevelop uh, what's what's left, the, the area that's been vacated by the waste? And I think the short answer, I'm probably missing a nuance of the question, but the short answer is a yes, that would be a classic brownfields project, a, uh, the, a development that is uh, impacted by the presence of a uh, uh, or, or likely presence of a hazardous substance or waste pollutant contaminant. Um, and indeed, there have been a number of landfill projects done that way, where the old online landfill is dug up, reconfigured, put into a new lined cell, and new real estate uh, created right next to it. And um, that real estate can be developed or uh, for uh, more intensive land uses, or uh, very often it's developed for um, um, recreational or community uses. Which brings me to Amy's case study, because Amy is, my, my perception is that real often what the community really needs is uh, open space, recreation, public, public space. And I think your case study speaks exactly to that. It does, it does. I think um, before I get started on that, I just, as I'm listening to these case studies and listening to all the layers of technical considerations and regulatory um, innovation that we've had over the years. I'm struck by just how complicated these sites can be. And as we're talking about preparing 
to access the funding that's coming down the pipe. I think that's kind of what we're, we're trying to prepare, right, to, to get our arms around and get ready for is really understanding um, some of the regulatory avenues that are available to us and how we can be creative there and how, um, from a technical perspective, how we can be creative there as well and stacking um, different funding opportunities. The, the park project, the Scissor Tail Park project in Oklahoma City is an example of, of really layering in um, community uh, desires, like you were mentioning, Mike, but also layering funding opportunities. The, the park itself was the capital improvement of the park itself was actually funded by a penny sales tax that was voted on by Oklahoma City residents. Um, but then also looking at regulatory, being creative from a regulatory perspective and an environmental condition perspective. Um, this area in Oklahoma City was kind of the core industrial, light industrial commercial area of Oklahoma City um, that went down to the Oklahoma River. And as um, we had a highway that was an interstate actually that was in between kind of blocked these two areas off from each other. And when that um, was, was rerouted, it opened up an opportunity here. And Oklahoma City looked at this area, which was really, was a lot of the picture on the left, a lot of old abandoned distressed properties, a lot of blight um, and saw an opportunity to create a, a central park. And so Scissor Tail Park is a 30 acre park on the north bridge with a pedestrian bridge that goes south to the Oklahoma River with another 40 acres of development that's happening, park development that's happening right now. Um, and as you can see in the picture on the right, there was a lot of just kind of spotty environmental conditions, some soil conditions, groundwater conditions that needed to be um, addressed in some way. And there was opportunity, I know Eddie was saying earlier, you know, taking um, a restriction on the site or kind of looking at risk-based corrective action, really understanding what the development was going to be and using the redevelopment as a part of our environmental solution. Here at Scissor Tail Park, we had the pedestrian bridge, which had a large berm associated with it. And we were able to contain some of this um, contaminated soil um, there under the berm so that there wasn't an exposure pathway to any of the users at the park. Um, this was one of those sites where EPA was excited to be a part of this project. Uh, they, Oklahoma City was awarded a site-specific assessment grant to do all of the assessment work required. There was over that was a $350,000 grant that um, was awarded to them. And then they were able to leverage that into, clean, into a cleanup grant that was awarded by EPA. So they received $600,000 from EPA in the form of a cleanup grant that allowed them mainly to deal with some of those soil issues, but also the, the park itself has a water feature um, that they wanted to line in order to prevent any contamination um, from, uh, from, from getting into that water feature. So the, the cleanup grant actually paid for the lining of that, uh, that water feature. If you are going to be joining us in Oklahoma City this year for the National Brownfields Conference, um, which has been, we're delayed one more time, right? we're at December uh, conference date now, but when you join us in Oklahoma City in December, uh, Scissor Tail Park will be our outdoor living room in front of the new convention center in Oklahoma City, um, which is also a brownfield site. So there's, we'll have lots of the opportunity to kind of show off uh, some of the innovation and um, what some of this funding can attach itself to here in Oklahoma City. The National Conference has been quite a place to make a network, meet people uh, that that uh, have got all kinds of uh, creative ideas uh, and, and, and challenging questions for us. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to address a question that uh, Jim asked, uh, which has to do with, uh, uh, we, we had a picture a little earlier with uh, vapor intrusion concerns. And uh, in, our, in, our, in our history, we've had uh, a lot of uh, places uh, that have used uh, solvents of one one type or another. Sometimes they use these solvents to treat metals to get them ready to uh, make make them stickier for paint. 
a, a real common use of solvents is to get the dirt out of my suit that I used to wear before there was a pandemic. But when I take that suit in for dry cleaning, they, they use perchlorethylene real often to, uh, to remove that dirt. And as we've discovered, it's really hard to keep solvents uh, under control. Solvents are in the ground in many parts of our, our cities, uh, formerly used areas. And um, this translates into an almost ubiquitous problem with um, vapor intrusion concerns. We really don't want people breathing solvents uh, in their home or in their, uh, in their place of work, if we can help it. And so vapor intrusion uh, is, is a whole separate um, webinar. We'll be doing one, I'm sure, a little later this year in one of our monthly series. Um, but it is really it's maybe the, the leading technical challenge that we face in California. I think I've got that right, Dan. It is for sure. And we have, we have a lot of experience uh, addressing it uh, both from a diagnostic perspective as well as from a mitigation perspective. Of course, SCS is a experience base uh, of uh, ad addressing uh, methane issues associated with landfills uh, trans translates nicely into vapor intrusion issues, right? Um, I, think that, I think the question is one of uh, you know, policy and regulation. Uh, EPA on one hand has, has, has a particular view of the world and uh, recall the contextual comments earlier that real estate's local and so are regulations, uh, whether they're state by state or jurisdiction by jurisdiction. <clears throat> California is taking a, uh, are trying to uh, look at it from a more comprehensive perspective and has uh, developed a draft vapor intrusion guidance document uh, to guide all of the state environmental agencies. Uh, that's been out for public review. And uh, those comments went in uh, around this time last year. Uh, as I understand it, the Cal EPA agencies are turning the crank to address those comments. I think it's safe to say uh, that that um, document is somewhat controversial in California, particularly as it relates to some of the application of the science from the translation of the EPA document, uh, specifically to the geography of California, and <clears throat> question whether or not that science actually applies in California or not. Uh, <clears throat> DTSC, DTSC has done some uh, studies and work around that topic, so I, I guess we'll see where that ends up, but uh, if this do guidance document, in fact, uh, uh, pops out the other side is essentially as as we saw it last, and I think it will result probably in uh, more sites being screened in for vapor intrusion uh, diagnostic work and uh, conceivably for for mitigation as well. So I think there's a there's a translation of uh, what's going to happen as a result of that. I see a question about whether that funding um, that some of the funding that we've been talking about today was is available to address vapor intrusion and it most certainly is. So EPA funding can be used to evaluate, assess whether or not there's a vapor intrusion um, condition, but it also can support, um, you know, from a cleanup perspective, any of those mitigation systems that are used. We're working on a project here in Oklahoma City where a, a nonprofit has purchased a really large uh, old dry cleaning facility. And over the years, um, it's been involved in EPA's program and uh, a vapor intrusion system, a mitigation system was a, a paid for through an EPA grant at that site. Um, so certainly it's something that we're, we're seeing in more and more of our Brownfields properties. We're getting near the end of our hour. Uh, the, one other a question that was posed was, and, and maybe this is a, particularly in coastal areas, uh, Vulnerability assessments. We've got some cities, uh, Norfolk, Virginia comes to mind. The city is sinking and the ocean is rising and the combination is something to consider. And um, in many jurisdictions, particularly in coastal areas, these vulnerability assessments are uh, right up there with vapor intrusion concerns, <laughs> perhaps even more as, a, as, extent, as existential um, to whether the project can go forward. Uh, another very common area of, uh, of study. That's why it's a good idea to build on the landfill. <laughs> Where you can get up high. <laughs> oh, golly. Well, uh, I don't see any other open questions in our queue. Uh, I did want to maybe just close with a couple of thoughts. Um, we've, we've talked about uh, some of the land use changes that are creating some of these opportunities. And I have a collection of them on the screen. Um, we know that uh, real estate's going to change. This pandemic is changing real estate, particularly with respect to things like our retail shopping centers, 
some of those retail shopping centers are going to get repurposed for logistics centers uh, to fulfill online orders that people are doing more and more rather than go to brick and mortar stores. Uh, a lot of these retail uh, 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 shopping centers have got uh, vapor intrusion uh, challenges that need to be addressed. Talked a little bit about recreation and public land use uh, uh, needs, uh, demands in many communities. Low income and affordable housing in more places than, uh, than you can imagine, really. That's a problem all over the country. And then Eddie's uh, example, the golf courses that uh, uh, there are too many golf courses in South Florida and too few houses. We need to reconvert uh, some of that golf course land into housing land. And we started with the note that we want to get ready now for the money that's coming, uh, the opportunities that are coming. These real estate opportunities as we repurpose from one land use to another, we need to meet the environmental challenges, line up the uh, funding that'll be needed to study and address those challenges, uh, figure out what the smartest uh, solution is, what the demand is in various communities and really pay serious attention uh, much more so than we've done historically uh, to the environmental justice concerns that Amy talked to us about briefly. That clearly is gonna be at the center of what this current administration uh, is, is planning to emphasize uh, as, as, as we try to even the scales and, and uh, uh, treat communities that have been underrepresented and over, over imposed upon, treat them more fairly going forward. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, how to uh, design a solution that, that tracks uh, the redevelopment project you have in mind, how to recover remediation costs. Uh, if, if, if that is a concern to, uh, uh, to affect the cleanup. And we've talked a little bit about these regulatory challenges, which uh, one thing I've learned sitting where I sit is that every community, every state, every local jurisdiction has a little different twist on how some of these national rules get applied. And in some cases, it's not just a little twist, it's a completely different program. And it really is important to make sure that uh, you're beamed in, you're, you're tuned in to the uh, local uh, jurisdictions requirements for these projects. That's what I thought we would talk about today. Any of my panelists want to get a word in as wise? I think there's some uh, <clears throat> great resources uh, that will be attached to the <clears throat> PDF PowerPoint for, for Brownfields and there's a couple of pretty cool uh, video links that are embedded there too. Any projects I know, Dan? <laughs> sure, <laughs> COM22. Yeah. And Amy's, uh, well, uh, Amy's uh, project in West Sacramento too. Oh, that's right. Uh, well, again, we'll uh, be happy to provide copies of these slides and the resources slide that Dan just mentioned uh, to anybody who wants it. Uh, you can, uh, you, we'll be following up with everybody who registered uh, to make them aware of that opportunity. On behalf of SCS engineers and Dan and Amy and Eddie, I thank you for your participation in our webinar this afternoon or this morning. And uh, everybody continue staying safe out there. We're getting near the end of this pandemic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.